have you seen all those like kind of meme almost surrealistic, you know, vaguely Salvador Dali style thumbnails that were produced by AI? Well, that's Dali. That's Salvador Dali. Dali. That's kind of where the name came from, I think. This is a neural network that's been trained that you can download, but it's also pretty much open source. So if you have a pretty beefy machine, you can run it on your own. So I've written a guide for how to get that up and running on Manjaro slash Arch, because it kind of wants a newer version of CUDA and a newer version of other libraries and a newer version of everything. So it's, a, it's actually a lot easier to run on something that's a little bit newer. And so the guide will walk you through that because as I was doing it, I tripped over some things and it took me a few minutes to get it set up. It wasn't really uh, super insanely well documented. But I also found a project, it was the Dolly Playground. It's a Docker container that will let you run this in Docker. Although how I show you to do it, you don't actually have to use Docker. You don't need to install Docker or anything like that. And I thought this might be a fun springboard to talk about what this AI does. And also some of the other AI news that's floating around like sentient AI loose inside Google and stuff like that. So well, let's separate the, uh, the hype from the reality and, uh, and talk brass tacks. Now, fun stuff, the nuts and bolts here. This is a really insanely high-end Threadripper system. It also has a Tesla V100 in it. That's like a $7,000 GPU with 32 gigabytes of memory, or at least it was until, I guess, the A100 came out. I don't have my hands on an A100. Uh, you know, <laughs> Nvidia wouldn't even send me a V100, so I've just, I bought those. It's fine, actually. I got them at a discount, so I shouldn't complain, but, uh, yeah, it's fun and you can run NVIDIA SMI and see how much it's using the GPU. Generating just seven or eight images uh, uses like 100% mm, of that GPU for the better part of a minute in order to be able to do what it does. And keep in mind, it's a pre-trained neural network. The way it works with neural networks is you have a huge input data set and then it's going through the huge input data set and is trained on that. And then it will produce its own original output based on novel inputs that are hopefully, vague, hopefully vaguely similar to whatever the inputs were that you gave it. So it had a whole bunch of inputs and then you know, sort of combined that in, in, in an interesting way using the model and that data set is what ultimately produces the output. It's not really super dissimilar from what would happen if you had a completely blank slate of a person and you trained them how to make a banana pudding and they would go through and it's like, okay, here are the ingredients, let's combine this do something that's banana pudding. Could they come up with something that's not banana pudding, but the riffs on the ingredients of banana pudding? Yes, probably. But the thing to keep in mind is that the AI doesn't have any context at all other than whatever you've given it. So an AI trained to produce banana pudding, if you gave it sawdust as an input, it's not going to realize that maybe you shouldn't eat sawdust. So it can produce some kind of hilarious results. Of course, you can brute force solve those problems when you're training AI by just feeding it everything and saying, oh, you know, if sawdust comes up in the ingredient list, no, that's not gonna make delicious banana pudding. Now, that's kind of how Dali is built, except instead of just making one thing, it's making tens of thousands of things, millions of things. And this model has been trained on hugely, hugely complicated systems. Now, the Dali project, if you go to the Dali Mini GitHub, that is actually where you can sort of start your journey down this rabbit hole. And it talks about, okay, you can download this and you can run this, but here are links to two pre-trained models that you can play with. From there, there is the Dolly Playground, which is what I'm using for this video and what I did for the, the video. So there's three models in there, Dolly Mini, Dolly Mega, and Dolly Mega Full. Uh, in my experimentation, Dolly Mega uses about eight gigabytes, nine gigabytes of VRAM and Dolly Mega Full can use upwards of like 15 or 20 gigabytes of VRAM. So it uses kind of a lot of VRAM. There are Google compute instances you can get that run this, but I've got the hardware available locally and I would hesitate to think what you would, what you would pay if you accidentally left on a cloud instance that has an eight gigabyte GPU reserved for it. It's going to be a lot of money. And then it's pretty entertaining and pretty novel to feed it inputs and see what its outputs are. 
I really was hoping for something a little bit more advanced when I fed it Danny DeVito as Gandalf the Grey. You know, sort of a recurring joke here is that we'll know we're in trouble when the AI gets to the point where, uh, you know, it's basically deep faking Danny DeVito into every character in Lord of the Rings if that's what I ask of it. And we can manually do that now between like the deepfakes AI and manually constructing that and that sort of thing. But Dolly is really meant for producing uh, original artwork or a certain style of original artwork. Now in getting this set up, I ran into a few issues. You know, when I installed Python CUDA, it didn't bring in CUDA as a dependency, which I guess kind of makes sense because you could be running CUDA on something else, but I had to manually install CUDA, so be sure that you install the packages. It was also useful to have NVIDIA SMI to see what the GPU was doing because there's not exactly HTOP for, for the GPU. Now, if you have time, inclination, and the data, you can do your own data set training. And this is a great way to take off and start if you want to start experimenting with machine learning. How is this put together? Python is a pretty readable language, even if you don't have a lot of experience with computer programming. If you're super curious about all these things, everything that you need to dive in here um, is basically given to you. You've got a Git repository and you can kind of see the nuts and bolts of how that's put together. And most of the frustration that you would be likely to run into is really just with the plumbing with hooking everything up because the version of CUDA matters and the version of this, that, or the other matters. There's a real danger too if you run into problems and you Google those problems, a lot of the solutions will be from like 2019, 2020, 2021, and you really shouldn't copy paste commands from those solutions because it is uh, outdated. It has to do with outdated CUDA versions. I'm using 11.7 but there were a couple of things that I needed that seemed to be 11.3 on the Python pip side. So as you go through and you install the requirements and you go through the step-by-step -step on the level one forum and you read over the how-to from, from the GitHub, there are a couple of things that are version dependent, but uh, uh, you know, by and large, don't go too far off of the, uh, off of the how-to because you may install something that will actually prevent it from working correctly, an old version of a library or something like that. Uh, if you have a tensor processing unit, like one of those TensorFlow accelerators, you can also use those with this. Although, I don't have one. I have one on order. I've had one on order for a year. Still hasn't made it. But uh, uh, it will use a TPU because you've got Python and PyTorch and some of the other dependencies that go with that. So don't be super afraid of all of the moving parts because there is a huge number of moving parts. This AI stuff, when you look at Dali, is this huge Rube Goldberg machine of insanity, and it can be very intimidating. And it's also kind of siloed, because the Python CUDA stuff is different than the uh, reading that you'll have to do for like the NVIDIA CUDA stuff and getting that going. So you get the system going with, with CUDA, and then you bring in Python and you do the CUDA acceleration in Python. And then you may also need some libraries that you get from PIP rather than, than from the, uh, you know, like the Pac-Man package management thing in, in Manjaro or Arch or whatever it is that you're using. You know, truth be told, messing around with this over the years, this is one of the easiest, you know, from scratch installations that I've done. I set up this machine completely from scratch, a totally fresh Manjaro installation, and never having done it before, you know, in like an hour, I was up and running with Dali, and it is an incredibly sophisticated, AI model. It is, it is uh, frankly unbelievable. The other thing in the news that you may be waiting for me to talk about is, you know, it's like the Google AI. Is it sentient? Does it look sentient? This was covered really well on an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, The Measure of a Man, because it was like, oh, you know, it's a fictional character, but it's like, here we have an android, an anthropomorphic android that, you know, exhibits a lot of the details of humanity. It's devoid of emotion by programming, apparently. Uh, but, you know, is it a life form? Does it have consciousness? And, you know, sort of the question came down there is, uh, how do you prove that you have consciousness? And so it's good that the engineer from Google is um, sort of worried about what if this possesses consciousness in even the smallest degree? Doesn't that afford some level of compassion? And it's really strange. The reaction to him inside of Google is really kind of shocking in, in my opinion um, because the guy that's the head of AI research for Google said, well, you know, maybe we are approaching sentience, but it's, it's totally, if you look at the phrasing 
for how Google was talking about their AI chatbot and the promising future and you know near borderline sentience. They use a lot of the same terminology and so the researcher that was suspended just goes the extra step and says, okay, you know, it definitely, I definitely believe that it is sentient. There have been a lot of news stories to cover, you know, is it sentient, is it not sentient? And most of those are designed to really hype up uh, what's going on there. They're just, it's clickbait. It's mostly clickbait. At a very bottom level, this is not general artificial intelligence. This is very specific artificial intelligence. It is like having something observe uh, every person that made banana pudding from the beginning of time, from the conception of banana pudding until the modern times, and feeding that into something that has no awareness or no consciousness or no, no context, no intrinsic anything, and then asking it questions about banana pudding. There, it may find patterns that human beings don't see because, you know, the entire human experience of banana pudding may not fit into one person's consciousness. Um, but it's reduced to a mathematical model. And that's probably not the only mechanism in our brains, and that's probably not the only mechanism that leads to consciousness. But I don't want the argument for consciousness to turn into an argument of splitting hairs, or a, an argument where it says, well, because of this one technicality, it is not conscious, but for all appearances and functionality, it does actually appear to be consciousness. I don't believe that we've yet achieved general artificial intelligence, but there are an increasing number of people that, that think, uh, academics, really smart people, that think that within the next five to ten years we'll have enough of these specialist um, uh, intelligences, artificial intelligences, that maybe we could have something that resembles a general artificial intelligence. To describe it really any other way on either side of the fence in terms of consciousness or not consciousness, I think is really overstating everything. We know how this was built. We know that mostly it is a statistical model. We know that the information that was poured into the statistical model is beyond the capabilities for a single human to comprehend. Do we think, do we have any reason scientifically to think that consciousness will fall out of that? No. And in fact, that we think that there's probably some good reasons that consciousness will not fall out of that. Consciousness is not going to fall out of this, no matter how many times I sort of feed it something. Even if it were feeding itself back, the AI that it generates were feeding back into itself as kind of is what happens with the Google chatbot, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, something, the spark of life, that something is happening there. I have a pet cat. It's not conscious, but it's no reason that I can't show it compassion. That's the kind of thing with the, the, the AI. I mean, it's, it's, we, are we creating a living thing? Is this, is this, is a single cell a living thing? Well, there are single celled organisms that we consider living. Is a virus a living thing? Well, biologically, we don't really consider viruses to be a living things because they're, they're kind of an automation. We don't yet have any classification for life for uh, an existence that is mechanical in nature, electromechanical or silicon or anything else. Are we gonna see that within our lifetimes? Oh yeah, I think so. Uh, for better or worse, it's coming. Uh, has that already happened inside Google? I kind of doubt it. I think we're gonna need the, the exponential function is probably just uh, one or two doublings away from that, that we have something that could be a simulation that is completely indistinguishable from consciousness, but maybe is not consciousness. Artificial intelligence is also just as a name, just if you deconstruct the name, it's very much like Tesla full self-driving. It is very much not full self-driving. It is a statistical model that's right some of the time, but not right a lot of the time. Uh, we'll get there, like as soon as we we're able to pour the entire human existence of all driving that ever has been into the model, then it will probably do really well. And that's why it's very important that Tesla and all of the vehicles collect all of your driving data from their system. All of the people that drive Tesla vehicles are contributing to this enormously huge mathematical model. Will consciousness fall out of the 
most detailed model of self-driving that has ever been created? The answer is no. Will it resemble something that almost looks prescient in terms of driving and collision avoidance and accident avoidance and anticipating what another driver that's maybe not full self-driving is going to do? Yes, it will be absolutely completely over the top bananas impressive assuming that they have excellent mapping from this impossibly huge data set of every human driver on planet earth that drives a tesla assuming that they're capturing and retaining it, literally everything we know they're capturing it we don't know about the retaining but uh assuming that they're able to competently distill that into an ai model then yes it's going to be indistinguishable from a human driver behaving in those human scenarios. So hopefully that helps you think about those kind of things. And if you want to be up and running with Dolly, well, boy, it is super interesting. It's a lot of fun to play with. I'm Little, this is Level 1. I'm signing out. And you can find me in the Level 1 forum.